I knew from when I was real small that people were gonna know who I was. I always had that feeling. I just never knew how they were gonna learn. I kinda enjoy it because now even after I die, people are gonna remember me forever. They're gonna talk about me for years. People in West Memphis will tell their kids stories. It, it, it'll be like, sort of like I'm the West Memphis boogeyman. Little kids will be looking under their bed before they go to bed. Damien might be under there. If I had the opportunity to speak to Damien Eccles, I would tell him that I hope he bust hell wide open. Period. And that if I could get my hands on him, I would eat the skin off of his face. Lost, the child murders at Robin Hood Hills. This film tells the tale of three teens who wore black, listened to Metallica, and perhaps as a result, were convicted in the 1993 killing of three young boys. Two filmmakers with incredible access spent almost a year in West Memphis documenting the trial and the town. Everybody in the town and in the courtroom and on the jury are all blinded by their fantasies about satanic cults. The criminal confession are too many manipulated by the police. I'm going to be wondering if the true killers were actually captured. The reason I had made the um, West Memphis Boogeyman comment during the first film was because I was making light of the situation. I was joking. I didn't realize that, I mean, it, I didn't even comprehend that the situation could get this serious, that it could actually go this far. Because I, I was thinking, if you haven't done anything, then they can't prove that you did something you haven't actually done. That didn't make sense to me. Now I see they can. You know, I wasn't even thinking about it whenever I said it, a spur of the moment thing. But a lot of people, it seems, didn't take it that way. You're not gonna be no boogeyman in West Memphis, because you're gonna be dead in hell. You're watching KATV Channel 7, The Spirit of Arkansas. Today marks the five-year anniversary of a West Memphis murder case that gained national attention. The bodies of three second graders, Stephen Branch, Christopher Byers, and Michael Moore, were found mutilated in a ditch. Now, one of the three men convicted for the murders, Damian Eccles, has prompted a hearing to try to get his conviction thrown out. Norris. That hearing started today in Jonesboro, where the trial also took place. Damien Eccles is trying to avoid being executed by lethal injection. He's claiming he didn't get a fair trial because of misrepresentation by his attorneys. Four years ago, an Arkansas jury found him guilty of murdering three second graders in a horrific ritualistic sacrifice. As our senior correspondent Tim Sullivan reports, he wants a new trial and a chance to live. After a month of investigation, police arrested Eccles and two of his teenage friends. Jesse Miss Kelly and Jason Baldwin. Police theorized the murders had been part of a satanic ritual. In addition to local media, the case attracted a documentary team that produced a film called Paradise Lost for HBO. As a result of the film, a nationwide support group has sprung up to help the young men they call the West Memphis Three. case is a travesty. It is a non-case. It is a case where someone is in prison right now because of prejudice. My son Christopher was the one that Jason Baldwin, Jesse Muskelly, and Damien Nichols murdered on May 5th, 1993, five years ago today. That's all we're really doing is trying to promote the case. You know, we're not experts, we're not lawyers, we're not scientists. You know, we just need to keep this case alive so people will do something. Where are you from? Los Angeles. And where are you from? I'm from Arkansas, Paris, Arkansas. And where are you from? Akron, Ohio. 
Mark, how do you feel about the West Memphis Three support group? To me, it's like uh, Jeffrey Dahmer fan club, Charles Manson fan club, Ted Bundy. You could name them all. Some people want to come to the rescue of a savage to get maybe their 15 minutes of notoriety on TV. So we get emails from all over the world, actually. You know, everybody knows there's doubt about this case, but we just want people to look at it again and maybe question it. They keep wanting to find someone else to blame to get their three off. That's their job, to take care of who they want, draw suspicion, do their thing. But the world knows who's guilty and who's innocent. Could you hold that out for me and let me get another shot? We wouldn't like to talk about the case. I'm here today because this is a hearing for Damian Uckles the fifth anniversary of the tragic murders, which he was convicted for, but we do not feel there was really sufficient evidence to warrant that conviction. Yeah, they're guilty. They're guilty as they are, and that's an atrocity for you to even want to say. Where's the profit going for these T-shirts? It all goes to raise publicity about the case. Every penny of it goes back into doing that. Why doesn't the, why didn't the profit go to the victim's families? Son of Sam Law says that Eccles or none of these three can make any money out of it. Them. It is going to the victims' families. It is it's trying to find out who killed these little boys. They know who kills these three little boys right there. I don't know it. They're cold-blooded murderers. In your opinion, it doesn't doesn't add up that way. In for my us. opinion, and 24 jurors out of the state of Arkansas's opinion, don't just say my opinion. These t-shirts, they're worth trash, garbage. I've been locked up six years for something that I didn't do. And sometimes um, the things that we go through that, that make us suffer are very good teachers. I think my suffering through this whole thing has taught me a very great deal. I have anger sometimes, but there's no one to direct it towards, you know? So I just really try to stay focused on uh, just going home, getting, letting everybody know that I am innocent. I didn't do this. Um, I don't really understand how they convicted me or got me in here or really how they did, how they just arrested me in the first place, you know? But it happened and I, you know, so I just can't really dwell on what's happening. I just gotta work with what's going on. Now. When they told me that I was going to spend the rest of my life in prison, at the time I wanted to tell them, you know, look, I don't want to do that. Just might as well just go ahead and kill me right now because I ain't no way I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison and miss my family. I just can't do that. But, you know, over the years past and everything, you know, I done, you know, I done got used to it, done adjusted to it and everything, how the system works and all that. You know, I adjust to it, you know. Basically, you know, it's, it's getting better and better by the day. You know, I just got to adjust to it more often. And it's getting better. But uh, I live, I, I'm going to make it through it. My name is Chris Worthington, and I'm from Akron, Ohio. Deborah Shu, I'm from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Oh, Kathy Bakken, and I'm from California. Grove Pashley, G-R-O-V-E, P-A-S-H-L-E-Y, and I'm from Los Angeles. Anna Mossick, A-N-N-A-M-A-C-E-K, from right outside Houston, Texas. I'm Ruth Carter, and I'm from Virginia. Uh, Bill Pritcherson, P-R-I-C-H-A-S-O-N. New Jersey. Gregory Fleming uh, from Alexander, Arkansas. I'm Marcia Ian, M-A-R-C-I-A, I-A-N, also from New Jersey. My name's Burke Sauls and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> Burke Sauls, B-U-R-K, S-A-U-L-S, -S, and I'm from Los Angeles, California. I'd like it if you could all tell me why, why some of you have come from so far, some I think have 
driven as far as cal from California, taken vacation time, spent money and so forth, to come to this fairly um, obscure in many ways hearing. I think I saw Paradise Lost the night it premiered on HBO in August of 96. And it just made me so mad that a modern day witch trial was being allowed to occur in America. I mean, it's not just the fact that they were making mistakes and getting the wrong people it looked like, but the fact that people seem to be reaching their decisions, even the, the jury, because of like things like emotions and prejudice and hysteria and their anger, and they weren't using their reason or common sense, or they weren't really even applying the law. And I just think that's the wrong way for things to happen in America. And I couldn't forget about it and just got angrier and... So finally I decided to look into the case. I wrote Damien and read all I could about it and finally just kind of stumbled upon um, other people on the internet who felt like I did about it. It just made me cry. It really made me cry because I was thinking, how in the world can they sentence this guy to death with what they have, which is nothing? When I went to work, you know, and, and they had um, caught the people that had done this, uh, my boss at work, she, uh, she just thought it was great, you know. She was like, well, they caught those freaks that killed those kids. What a relief. Yeah, well, I mean, those were exact words, like, caught those freaks. And I said, well, you know, they haven't even done the trial yet. What, what makes you think they did it? And she was like, well, look at them. Look at the way they dress. Of course they did it. I thought, golly, I better stay in the house then, because <laughs> it's not safe for me out there then. I think that's a real typical scenario people go through. Uh, they first joined the list is that I watched Paradise Lost, I also wore black t-shirts, I was an alienated teenager, and I think that might be the initial attraction that brings people in, right. but I think what's really important and that brings people together to the point where you travel across country to come to Jonesboro, Arkansas on your week of vacation <laughs> are the more important issues such as justice, mm -hmm. such as a corrupt uh, incompetent police force and justice system working in a vacuum here in Arkansas when nobody's watching. That's why I'm here. I don't want them to think they can operate in the dark, kind of like a mushroom and grow. No one enjoys uh, sentencing somebody to, to death. Nobody enjoys having to I go through the um, the trial. That's why they call it a trial, I guess, because it is uh, heart jerking and difficult to deal with. Um, when you read those words imposing the death sentence, uh, I don't know if it was visible, but there was a catch in my throat. I could feel it, and certainly that th you you have those feelings. Uh, it's it's hard. All right, gentlemen, if, you, if you'd have your client stand, please. All right, Mr. Eccles, the jury having found you guilty of capital murder, three counts in the death of Michael Moore, Chris Byers, and Steve Branch, you are to be immediately transported to the Arkansas Department of Corrections, where the director or his duly appointed and designated representative will, <clears throat> on the fifth day of May of 1994, will be directed to cause to be administered a continuous intravenous injection of a lethal quantity of an ultra-short-acting barbiturate in combination with a chemical paralytic agent into your body until you are dead. There's never been a moment that I've ever doubted that we did not arrest the right individuals. Never in my mind. There's never been a doubt. I can go to bed at night and sleep knowing that I did my job and did it well. If there was a doubt in my mind, I would still be on the police department, I'd still be working the case. This is Detective Brian Reed of the West Memphis Police Department conducting an investigation for the offense of triple homicide, case file number 9305-0666, currently in the office with Jesse Lloyd and Miss Kelly Jr. What occurred while you were there? When I was there, 
I saw Damien hit this home, hit this home boy real bad. Now he started screwing him and stuff. What did he hit him with? He hit him with his fist and bruised him all up real bad. Jason turned around and hit Steve Branch. Okay. And he started doing the same thing. Then the other one took off. Michael O. Moore took off running. So I chased him and grabbed him and held him to they got there and then I left. Well, I was telling them, you know, I don't know nothing about it. And they just kept on agging it on, agging it on, agging it on. Finally, I just, just said something where they'd just leave me alone. And I, finally, I told them, you know, I chased them and everything and caught them and brought them back. But none of that happened. You know, you just, you can't kill nobody and don't leave no evidence. You can't do it. You know, I don't care who you are, you cannot do that. You know, there was no blood. No fingerprints, no, no nothing at the crime scene. You just can't kill nobody like that. I don't care if you're a genius or nothing. You just can't do that. Inspector Gitchell, let's talk about the things that, that Jesse told you that are just absolutely incorrect. Now, on page 9 of his statement, Inspector Gitchell, Jesse says that the murders took place around noon. How did you know that was incorrect? because the boys were, the young boys were still in school. Did at any time when he was telling you these things that you knew were incorrect, did it ever occur to you that what he was telling you was false, his entire story was false? Uh, Jesse simply got confused. This is a classic example of how police can produce a false confession. They threaten Jesse, they tell him that he knows things that they know he knows, they use the polygraph, they tell him that he's flunked the polygraph when he didn't. They use that to convince him that his situation is hopeless. They upset him enormously by showing him these horrible photographs of these dead children. And then they give him the option of being with the bad guys with the consequences of that or joining the police. And at this point, all he wants to do is get out from under the pressure. So now all he has to do is agree with what they tell him, and that's how they set it up. Initially, they're going for a false witness statement, but once they have him talking, it's not difficult to get him to agree to things that will make him appear to be a participant in the crime. Out of the hundred or more people that y'all talked to, are you aware of anybody other than the defendant who told you one of the victims that had their genitals removed and one of them had cuts to the side of the face and it had been some grabbing of the ears. Uh, there was no one else that mentioned those particular injuries. Was there any kind of emotional response? He had tears coming down his eyes. Right. Had y'all yelled at him or been mean to him or no, threatened sir. him or promised him anything, done any of those things? None of those things happened whatsoever. All right. Well, I was down at uh, prison a couple weeks ago and seen Jesse. And uh, he tells me that you come down about every Sunday. Yeah. I try to boost his morale up. Just hang in there for me. We're doing everything we can. Sometimes it seems that things are kind of progressing at a snail's pace, but that's unfortunately the, the wheels of justice. There is no justice. Well, I got to tell you, that I had to ask myself whether I still wanted to be a lawyer, but uh, it just lit a bigger fire under me and it made me want to get up and fight that much more. So. Well, they didn't, they didn't let you present your case in, up there in court. I noticed that. So, but we gotta have hope. Without hope, we don't have a chance. I've made a promise to that kid of yours that I'd never give up the fight, and I don't intend to do that. Maybe the quickest way to get Jesse out of that prison is to catch a killer. Yeah, well, I think everybody knows who's done it, but uh, ain't nobody saying anything. If you wouldn't mind, can you all, you three, tell us how, what the genesis of the list and the website and everything, mm -hmm. how you came to um, create it? I saw the movie 
I got an advanced screener because I work for an advertising agency and we worked on the um, key art which is like the movie poster art so I saw it about three or four months before it actually aired. We saw the film together, yeah, Kathy yeah. and I, and we immediately saw it and thought, oh gosh, Burke would probably like this. <laughs> 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 actually not like it, but yeah. um, so we headed over to Burke and then Burke uh, took a copy of it and watched it and I think about four days later, not only Burke had seen the film, he'd already found a book in a used bookstore on the case and he called us up and he says, these guys are innocent. I got on this uh, crusade to find every scrap of information I could and we got all the uh, all the documents we could get our hands on and uh, it, it became a um, obsessive type of like a collector's type thing when we were each you know we'd get a, another tiny scrap of information we'd add it to the archive on the web and we decided to make it public too we wanted it not just be in our own little filing cabinets but we said let's give this to everybody after a while it became apparent that no one had actually looked at evidence and put together a scenario that made sense. And so we started doing more research about, you know, investigation and homicide and forensics and, and uh, we came across a website that actually gave forensic and investigative classes like criminal profiling and, and uh, homicide investigation, that kind of thing. So I thought it would help me in understanding the case more if I took these classes. So I just started taking the classes and, and in doing so I read all the articles that Brent Turvey had written. Um, he's the guy that gives the classes through Knowledge Solutions. And I liked his philosophy. It made sense. It was about evidence. You know, it's criminal profiling as it relates to evidence. And I thought, maybe this is what we need. Someone who could take this evidence and tell us what happened. Because that's all we want to know. Guilty or innocent. I just want to know. So um, I called him up and I started explaining the case. And he just said, stop, you know, get the lawyers tell them to call me, and so I did, and then, you know, the rest is history. Hey. Hi, Dan, how are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. This is my wife and business partner, Barbara. Nice to meet you, She's Barbara. taking my notes today for me. Great. So we get our hands can be free. Thanks a lot. Well, I thought I would have put you over there by the easel so you could oh, use that. <laughs> An assortment of markers here for me. Now, I want to really thank you for agreeing to meet me here and talk about this. I, you know, I've been working on this case for a long time. It's been it's been over four years, and uh, when I got the email from Kathy at the at the support fund for the first time in a long time, I got to see a, a ray of hope for some justice and and maybe having this thing analyzed. And and uh, you don't know how much it means to us. We didn't have uh, a budget to work with. We didn't have uh, access to this kind of information. We tried to get it, but we just couldn't. We couldn't accomplish it, and um, it's just it's uh, it's it's really it's really good to be able to look at this stuff now and analyze it, even if it is four years later. Do you want to go right and look sure. at the? Uh, look at the uh... Okay, I brought the uh, the crime scene photos. In every other case that I've worked on, the crime scene photos are always these very they're like endangered species. You know, you never see them. The actual crime scene photos are kind of spirited away. And uh, what the defense usually gets is nothing, uh, or, or color photocopies that are really bad. In this case, I was very surprised to receive all the actual crime scene photos. One of the, the, the cornerstones of the prosecution's case was that this was a ritualistic, satanic, right. cult uh, homicide. Do you say anything here from the crime scene characteristics would, which would be indi indicative of Satanism or ritualistic homicide by a cult or anything of that nature? Most certainly not. There's a, there's a definite lack of ritual element to this crime. It's very, uh, it's very unfocused uh, in terms of the nature of the injuries. Uh, it's very much a reactionary type of uh, behavior, not ritual. And these behaviors that we see in this crime take time. So it would not be plausible for a serial killer or a satanic cult group to grab these victims because of the fact that they are going to be missed almost immediately from the moment that they're abducted. And whoever dumped the bodies here knew that this place was here. He knows the area. This is not some place that you can just find being a trucker off the highway. You gotta know it's here. You gotta be able to walk in, uh, dump the bodies and walk out. You gotta, you gotta know that this is available. It's, it's very clear to me from the evidence that, uh, and we can get into that later, that the offender did know the victims. This is the MCI operator. I 
to have a collect call from Damien, who is in an Arkansas correctional facility. All calls, other than properly placed attorney calls, will be monitored and recorded. All right. Am I on speakerphone? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. How you doing? Oh. All right. So there's like about 15 people saying hello right now. Hello, Damien. It's a conspiracy. Hello, bro. Everybody, <laughs> everybody's saying hello now. Hi, hello, hello, hi. How many of them is it on there now? 25. I just put in the call for questions on the discussion group. Okay. Okay. Beastie wants to know, I teach at a university and tell my students about your case. What would you most like them to know about you? That I am neither a freak nor a monster. Um, that I was basically a victim of circumstance that anyone could have been, end up in the same situation that I'm in. Do you ever th does the reality of being executed ever bother you? Like, do you ever think that's going to happen? I guess, yeah. It, it bothers me sometimes. It doesn't bother me in the uh, area of, of, like, being afraid to die. What bothers me is um, leaving so much left undone. And that us three being behind bars or even sentenced to death or, or being in prison for the rest of our lives, that is not going to in any way bring about justice because we didn't kill those children. I, I think it's pretty sad that society can evolve uh, to the stage that it has yet still be barbaric enough that um, it puts innocent people like myself, Jason Baldwin, and even Jesse Miskelly in prison and can even sentence you to death while the real killer still walks the streets. You know, here's where I live today, number 11. An apartment somewhere in the state of Arkansas. That's good enough. I came from a real nice big home with all the amenities and luxuries that you could have to what I like to call my humble, modest studio apartment. A giant 300 square feet. A bedroom, a living room, a kitchen, and a bathroom. But there's benefits to it. it takes me five minutes to vacuum five minutes for the air conditioner to cool the place down, and I don't have to walk far to go to the bathroom. So it's a good little spot to live, to be by yourself, to control your thoughts, your emotions, and to live the rest of my life as God sees fit. As I look at all these dark clouds roaming in on me today, it can very easily remind me of May 5th, 1993. This half was a bright, sunshiny day. This half became gloom and doom. And as the death and destruction rolled into West Memphis, Arkansas and consumed three babies' life and killed them, it's kind of like this cloud front is rolling in and cooling off the day and consuming me as I stand here in the wind amidst the storm. And the storm is what I have been in for the last three years. But thank God there's a bright side on the other side. I've been down in a lot of low valleys, and people have tried to take me out. But I'm still here. Jesse, Jason, Damien, those names ring in my ears daily. And I still hate you. Forever and a day shall I still hate you. Byers, when he's running around cussing me and telling me that I should go to hell and stuff, seems like he's play acting, you know, trying to divert the attention trying to play the role that he should be of an angered parent when really he's really i believe he's the one that did it the murders of three west memphis boys last year shocked all of region eight during the trials earlier this year we empathized with the parents and relatives of those little boys and because of television we were able to see and hear the emotions those parents were going through now the parents of one of the boys find themselves once again under public scrutiny. Jenna? Since the trials, the buyers moved from West Memphis to Cherokee Village. Now they say they wanted to start a new life, but now they face criminal charges. They're accused of taking $20,000 worth of property from a neighbor's house. 
Police have witnesses who claim they saw the buyers loading stolen items into their pickup truck, and when police searched the buyer's house, they found a few of them. Mark and Melissa Byers face additional charges in their old hometown. West Memphis police have 13 warrants for the buyers for allegedly writing over $700 in bad checks. The buyers also face other charges. When they moved to Cherokee Village, the buyers became good friends with their neighbors, John and Donna Kingsbury. Problems began when Mark spanked the Kingsbury's five-year-old. I took the fly swatter and I just, on the, just the plastic end, just on the back of his blue jeans. And I said, now you get home. You've been a bad boy. But the Kingsbury say the whipping bruised their son. We did have to have a restraining order put on them because I was worried about my family. Mark Byers' problems began in July. He's been charged with contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Police say he stood by holding a gun and allowed a teenaged friend to assault John Shaver Jr. According to a police report, the teenager used a closed pocket knife in his fist to assault Shaver. The fight sent Shaver to the hospital with a concussion. Byers admits the knife was his. He also admits there was a gun in his car. The Shavers say Byers used the gun to prevent bystanders from stopping the fight. I think I'd be extremely... Shavers' angry. father believes this raises serious questions about Byers. You know, there's a lot of people that's talked to me about it, which I, I hate to say it, but they think maybe he might have had something to do with the, those murders. Mark Byers says that's ridiculous. But these charges and the questions they dredge up may stick with this family forever. People are placing a lot of emphasis on, on Mark and could he have been a suspect? And there again, it's the same question that was asked to me, did we pick Damien up because he looked weird? Well, are we accusing Mark Byers because he has a ponytail and looks a little weird and he's a big kind of guy and, and is kind of boisterous? I mean, is that why he's labeled as uh, having something to do with it? No. You have to look at the facts, and the facts are the three that we arrested and that have been convicted are the ones that did this. Mark Byers didn't have anything to do with this crime at all. Who did you receive this knife from? I received it from, uh, uh, how did I actually receive no, it? Who did you receive the knife from? I received it from uh, uh, Joe and uh, the people with HBO okay. Productions. Here, this red area here, this is the, uh, the shaft of the penis. And here is where the scrotal sac and testes should be and they're missing. So what we have is that the, the skin overlying the penis and the head of the penis has been carved off. It's gone. It's not there. You can see this is probably the single worst case of sexual mutilation I've seen. So this this uh, stab wound right here, this, this one right here, it's a nice uh, elliptical shape there. Nice stab wound right there. See those little sort of abrasions that come along the top there and off the side there? Uh -huh. Those indicate movement. Now that is either the person stabbing the knife in and twisting it, or the person who's being stabbed is moving. And a lot of them uh, at all kinds of funny angles well, Peretti, uh, that mean to me that the guy, the kid was moving around. Dr. Peretti testified at Miss Kelly's trial in Corning that this could have been done with a knife or it could have been done with a sharp piece of glass. Two weeks later, he <laughs> testifies that this someone is someone who has a great deal of knowledge of anatomy <laughs> and that the penis is, is skinned meticulously, which would take right. a great deal of time under laboratory conditions. What can you tell me about that? Uh, on really close examination, this is why I brought you the magnifying glass, because I want you to look right here. You can see the, the impression of the handle of the knife as it is being plunged 
See that little squareness right there? Mm -hmm. And so whoever did this went like this and grabbed it and just went like that. And that's how they cut it out. No, preci no precision, no accuracy, no skill required to do that. And it actually, to me, it's consistent with what is a fishing knife that's got the, uh, the blade on one side and the serrated top on the other. Because of the movement involved and because of the depth, that right there is something that only somebody who's like really angry is going to do. This is not, this is not a, this is not an act of deliberation or an act of that's well thought out or is well it planned. Is an act of sexual gratification? I don't believe so. I believe it's an act of uh, anger. Mr. Byers, I need to ask you about a defense exhibit number E6, this particular folding lock blade Kershaw knife. If I could approach the witness, Your Honor. Yes. On January the 26th, did Gitchell tell you, let me explain a problem we had, and you need to answer this for me. We have found blood on this knife. I don't remember if he said there was or not. Did you have any idea how human blood was on that knife? Well, yes, I would have an idea. I cut my thumb. All right. Do you recall stating, I have no idea, no idea how it could have any human blood on it? Do you recall giving that answer? Yes, sir. Then do you recall stating, I don't even remember nicking myself with it, cutting the deer meat or anything? Is yes, that the sir. answer you gave? Yes, sir. And is that the truth? I might not have remembered it at that time when he was questioning uh -huh. me, but I could have remembered it later on in the day and talked to him about uh -huh. it. Okay. Mark Byers, everywhere he goes, trouble follows him. Well, didn't him and his wife uh, break in these houses, get these statues and all this stuff? Yeah, and then they just got slapped on the wrist. And he, gets, he can get into as much trouble as he wants to get into, and they just never do anything to him. And he's apparently not that great of a person because from hearing people talk about places that he wants to live or houses that he wants to get, the neighborhood freaks out, and they don't want him living there. I tell you what really worries me about Mark Byers is he's got a thing for knives, <laughs> like the knife he gave to HBO. And then later on, he gives a, a teenage boy a knife. If you had a child that was brutally murdered by a knife, you wouldn't be giving another kid a knife to fight another kid and then hold a gun on him and make him do it. I mean... Well, I wouldn't go far enough to say that Mark Byers murdered these little boys, but I think he had something to do with it. And I just can't figure out what. And I think there's a lot of people that probably do know. I had three or four people come to my house to look me up to tell me that they believed that my son was innocent and that they personally knew Mark Byers and that um, they believed that he was capable of doing a crime like that. And they said they had been to the police, but the police wouldn't listen. And I feel really bad about what happened to Melissa Byers because it concerns me that maybe she found out something that she shouldn't have. And I'd like to know what really happened to her. But she could have been here to hear me sing lightly. He liked to hear me sing, didn't he? I think his little Christmas tree will stay there real well. It's in there tied enough. I don't think the wind will blow it over or anything. Come here and kneel down here by me. Oh, God, why did you let this happen? Please help us through it. God, please help us through this.
these are for you, Melissa. I know how you love red roses, baby. This is all I can do for you. I know your heart was broken. I know you couldn't stand the death of your child. But oh God, I wish you hadn't left me. You remember when we were on our honeymoon? How happy we were. We worked together. We ate together. We went everywhere together. We weren't husband and wife. We were best friends. I loved you with all my heart. You remember when we opened our jewelry store? We finally accomplished something. Had two sons doing good, nice house, nice business, two dogs and a cat, just an average family, trying to live our life the best we could. I can never put into words how much I loved you. You were everything to me. You were my life. I lived to see you smile. Those animals killed you. They're evil animals and they killed you and I blame them for your death. And all for you morons, infidels, and fools that think I had anything to do with it. Go to hell! Go to hell! I love my wife more than any man could love his wife on the face of the earth. I'd have died for her. I took care of her. She was my life. I didn't do anything but love her. And for all you sick son of a bitches out there that think I had anything to do with her life, go to hell! Go to hell! Think what you might, but you can kiss my ass. <laughs> I can't understand why exactly people are glossing over the obvious when it comes to Byers and the death of Melissa Byers and all the things that Byers has said and done since this trial. I think maybe for the general public, uh, it's not quite as scary to believe that bloodthirsty Satanists were out murdering children as it is to believe that parents are actually murdering their own children. Now, you're, you're aware that you're here to take a polygraph test today. Yes. And this is concerning the deaths of three boys. Yes. Sir. At West Memphis in 1993. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, you're also aware that this, a record, an audio and video record is being made of this uh, procedure. Correct, sir. Have you got any problem with that? No, sir. If you do, I want to know about it now because I don't want anything bothering you. I don't have any problem with it. Okay, that sounds good to me. Mark, what we're going to do today we're going to talk about what happened uh, in West Memphis. We're going to talk about you, where you come from, who you are. Okay, sir. What's your name, full name? John, <clears throat> Mark, Byers. B-Y-E-R-S. B-Y-E-R-S, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what about your relationship with Christopher? Oh, he's my best buddy. And did you all, did you all um, have disputes like your <coughs> father and son have, I'm sure? Well, in the beginning, of course, he was little, but when he got up four or five, 
he started having behavior problems. Mm -hmm. And Melissa didn't know what was wrong with him. I didn't know what was wrong with him. In hindsight, now I can look back and say, boy, if I'd known that, I'd have never spanked him or I'd never given him time out or I wouldn't have done anything like that. You say you spanked him. What was your intent when you spanked him? Was it your intent to hurt him? Oh, no, sir. To discipline him? Discipline Did you ever hurt him? No, sir. Son, I know there's thousands of eyes watching what I'm going to do. I know I made mistakes. I'm not a perfect father. But I know I loved you with all my heart. And I know I tried to keep you from getting hurt. I know the times I had to spank you or punish you. It was because I loved you, son. I loved you, and I didn't want anything terrible to happen to you. With your knowledge of the amount of blood that was lost from not only Chris Byers, but these other boys who've had some pretty, they're gonna bleed as well, won't they? Oh, yes. Okay. Do you have an opinion as to whether or not you could clean up that amount of blood at a scene in the dark? Do you have an opinion as to that? I think it would be quite difficult to do, to have injuries of this nature without having any blood. I mean, that's, I, I would question that about the blood. One of the bodies was discovered in this area right here. There's a place up there on, on the hill where those two trees grow together right there. Mm -hmm. That was one of the other reference points on the crime scene diagram. The prosecution, their theory was that uh, the murders occurred here in the creek bank and that, uh, that actually they actually, the homicides took place here on this little kind of plateau area, and that uh, the defendants threw water up on the bank and washed all the blood away. The water was about, about this And high. the water, and the, the theory being that the water it would hit the bodies and wash the, wash the blood back into the river? And wash away the evidence. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how that would work, uh, or why they would think it would work. Unless they had someone throwing water at the same time the, the uh, castration. You could, you could use place. a garden hose on the bodies and you wouldn't get all the you wouldn't get all the blood away. I mean, that's like, there would have been so much blood, the amount of blood at this crime scene. If this had been the place where the, uh, where the buyer, where Chris Byers alone was emasculated, there would have been so much more blood than that. And the, plus, they wouldn't have been able to see it. It would have been an incomplete job. So this is only a disposal site. Two of the kids did die here because they were put in the water and they drowned. But this is a, a disposal site only, not a, uh, a primary crime scene. I'd have to say that the making of the film Paradise Lost was was a, a new situation for the court and I'm sure for all of the lawyers involved. I think I had indicated to the producers earlier that, that if either the defense or the prosecution had objected, there wouldn't have been any filming in the courtroom. But if I had the decision to do over again as to whether a documentary was made, I probably would, would not allow it. Damn. Well, Beth, right now the new attorneys, the appellate attorneys for Damian Eccles, are conducting a hearing inside this courtroom. They have on the stand a lawyer who represented one of Eccles' co-defendants at trial um, a, a few years ago. What they're trying to do is establish that the trial lawyers in this case who represented Damian Eccles were ineffective, that they were incompetent. The main argument is that they had a conflict of interest because they agreed to uh, cooperate with filmmakers who were making a documentary about the case, an award-winning documentary called Paradise Lost. It was produced by HBO. The argument these attorneys are going to make is that because Damian Eccles' trial lawyers made an agreement uh, to cooperate with those filmmakers, and the allegation is that they accepted money from those filmmakers, that that created a conflict of interest which made them in a con incompetent and ineffective to assist Damian Eccles at trial. <laughs>
We expect that when the prosecutors cross-examine the lawyers who represented Damian Eccles, those lawyers will testify that they did not make a deal to take money from the filmmakers, that the agreement was that the filmmakers would provide money for a trust fund for the defendants, that the money did not go to the attorneys, it was not for the attorneys, and it did not create a conflict of interest. That will be the argument the prosecutors are going to draw out to try to make sure this conviction stands up. I think one of the ironies about this motion is that a lot of the, uh, the lawyers who are involved in it now, Ed Millett, Barry Sheck, Bob Fogelnest, high-profile lawyers, never would have heard of this case, you know, before the documentary came out. Okay. You know, I'll send you a, uh, I can send you a copy of the piece we did based really? on the interview. Man, I'd love to have it. It's basically, you know, we talked about death row, what it's like to be on death row, etc. Um, you know, Was said, there still long then? Oh, yeah. You ever say thank you? Yeah. That's what it looked like when he was here last. I guess they wanted to clean him up and make him look presentable. There he said that wearing a white shirt. Yeah, he said wearing a white shirt really gave him a headache, so I know it's just killing him sitting in there in the courtroom. He said white was on the good, you know, the good side. He liked to stay on the dark side. He didn't say that to me. When you were going through the treatment that you were going through that led you to file that suit, how did you finally get to the point where you did file it, talk to the lawyers, etc.? I don't really even know. I mean, it's, you know, one day you wake up and you figure out what's the worst thing they can do to you? Kill you? I mean, I'm sitting here on death row anyway. What else are they going to do to me? You don't have anything to lose when you're in a situation like that. I went to see Damien yesterday, and for the first time in four years, I got to touch him. I got to hug him, and it was hard to believe how much he had grown taller. He was at least a head taller than I was. Can't believe you had to go all that time without even being able to give him a hug. He's 20-something years old, but he's still my baby. And that's what it felt like when I put my arms around him. And then he sat down. You could tell he was really nervous because he's been out by himself for so long. He was having a really hard time being around people. I was allowed to visit with Jason after he was sentenced. And it was the first contact visit we had had in a year. It was just, it was thrilling to be able to hug him, but then I had to let him go and go <coughs> to this horrible place for something he didn't, he didn't do. When I start thinking about what all they go through in prison, my mind, I just can't handle it. You know, I just start freaking out when I try to start imagining what Jason's life must be like or Damien's life must be like. I heard a lot of stuff that had happened to Damien that it's really, really hard to deal with. You're in a position where you can't do anything. And if you stop and think about it very much, some of the things that that are done to him. It, it, I think it could make you lose your mind knowing that something like that's being done to your child. Because what's happened to them in prison is gonna, it's gonna affect them for the rest of their lives. When they come home, it'll never be, it'll never be like it ever was because these, these boys were just children too. Whenever these little boys were murdered, our boys were just children, too. I never knew what hell could be like until these last four years. My whole life has changed. Lost my home. 
Good job. Nothing seems to matter anymore. It's kind of like that song. I got a song I dedicated to Vice and it's Nothing Else Matters by Metallica. That's my song to him because really I feel like most of the time nothing else matters to me but getting Jason home. And I just don't know how I do it. Damien, when our visiting time's over, he always stands up <laughs> and puts his hand against the glass for me to put mine against his. We're not actually touching, but we are. It's in the heart anyway. If you could speak to the families of these these kids who think you did it, you know, what would you say to them? Um, if I could um talk to the families and the victims right now. I don't know really, really what I'd say. Um, just they were led to believe by the police that we done it, and so I understand that they hate us, you know, hate me. But I didn't do it, you know. I didn't have anything to do with it. I'm sorry that your kids are dead. I'm sorry about that. I'm really sorry about all that, because I didn't, I don't have a kid. But if it was like my little brother, I'd be real angry at whoever done it. And, but. All I ask is y'all go back and look at the evidence. Just just stop and think and don't let your emotions about it all um, get to your head and just stop and think and look back at the evidence and look where the evidence does point and ask yourself, now who do you think really done it? You know, because um, it, it was a great tragedy that kids was killed, but it's also another great tragedy that American citizens, anybody, today's public can just be picked up for a crime they didn't commit and be convicted of it without no evidence. That's another tragedy. In this particular case, you have uh, the fortune of having what appears to be bite mark evidence right there in the face that was not originally mentioned, documented, or what have you, but uh, these type of bite marks are uh, there are two kinds. They're oh, the ones, are you you're oh. talking about bite marks on the outside of the That's right. victim's face? Not, That's right. Not superficial no. bite marks on the inside of the mouth caused yeah. by their own teeth. Not superficial on the inside caused by their own teeth. There are what appears to be bite marks all over certain parts of these children's bodies. But well, did he miss that? Or did he... Did it, no, I don't remember it's seeing not in the autopsy report. report. And the great thing about bite mark evidence is bite mark evidence is like... It's uh, just as good as a fingerprint and it's better than DNA because... Uh, Bite mark evidence indicates a specific person committing a specific behavior. The bite mark indicates that you bit somebody at a certain spot at a certain time. So if we have somebody biting this individual here, a certain person, we have, we have a specific behavior tied to a specific person. So that's the best kind of evidence as far as I'm concerned for this type of crime. Whenever you have teeth mark, it's uh, typically, if you were to show this to an emergency room pathologist who'd seen a lot of these, he would arrest the mom because it's more typically resembling the type that's involved in the cases of child abuse. We have a case, mother a of a victim who is no longer alive. Right. Melissa Byers has been dead since March of 96. I don't see any reason why her autopsy should still be uh, being sealed. They claim they're still conducting a criminal investigation, but uh, you know, how long does it take to Again, in, in this particular case, since what you've told me is that the, uh, the death is undetermined, they can keep it open as long as they want. If they, but, but the problem is, they, if they're keeping it open, they, that means they don't know whether it's a suicide or a homicide. And that means it's undetermined, which makes, means it's an equivocal death. But it's important to this case, and the reason I originally asked you for the materials is because I'd like to know if there's a connection. I'd like to see her wounds. I'd like to see if there's any wounds on her. I'd like to see if there's a connection between this case and that case. And... 
the reality is I would like also, <laughs> also if you get a forensic odontologist in here at any point in time, they can yank her teeth and see if they match any of the bite mark uh, impressions because we need to at least, if, if there's nothing wrong, if there's no connection, we need to establish that there's no connection to these deaths. I've wondered, you know, why it's been almost two years and I have called everybody they've told me to call about getting a death certificate or an autopsy report on my wife and they won't release it. Newspaper people have called, they won't release it. They won't say it's still pending. What's still pending? If they can't say cause of death wasn't anything but a heart attack, all they have said was a prescription medication that she was taking was found in her bloodstream and a foreign drug. They never would release what the foreign drug was. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what caused her to die. They won't tell me. And I think that just gives people suspicion. The police up there, they didn't care about us. They didn't care about her dying, and they still throwing gas on the fire because if there ain't nothing to hide, why won't they give me the paperwork that I'm entitled to? Well, is that or bring charges against and you they, one or the other? They ain't got no charges to bring against me because I didn't do nothing. I know that. I, you know, I ain't got a doubt in my mind on that, but that's, that's like you said, that's not the point. Two years, and, and they won't release it. Uh, they're just holding it open so people can sit out here and draw their own conclusions and... and Tell it like they want it to go. Because people would rather talk any day of the week about somebody else than to sit and talk about their own problem. I mean, what do you think it makes me feel like when I hear people say, oh, I believe you killed Christopher. I believe you had something to do with killing Melissa. I can't tell you how it hurts. Man, it tears me apart. And going to a grocery store, go anywhere. I'm subject to walking into a fool and say that. Y'all been with me yeah. when people walk up and say, don't I know you? Yeah. Wasn't you the baby killer on TV? Yeah. Well, I've been in two fights myself over it. What was it? Because, well, in a bar one night there in Mark Creed, dude come up and said, yeah, sorry, Mark Byers. Hell, they didn't, them boys didn't kill his kid. He was in on that. He was probably the regulator on it. Uh, excuse my friends, but I stomped his ass right there on the spot. Well, you know, I've had an ignorant woman. She was a school teacher there in West Memphis. Taught Jesse Muskelly in his GED, you know, his alternative school. Yeah. And this woman showed the movie Paradise Lost and talked about how that I was basically guilty for it and that the police and everything framed them three and there wasn't no cult and Jesse Muskelly was a good loving boy and just such a kind person. Those three animals took my baby from me and they took my wife from me. And I self-destructed. And buddy, I'm telling you about I got downright mean. The pain they've caused me, it cost me physically and mentally and all the fights and all that I got into because I went to looking for them and the bricks that hit me in the head and the knives that cut these scars on my face and the jerks that had the privilege of knocking teeth out of my mouth, well, that's caused them three animals that provoked me so to get into a violent rage like I had. And that's what it cost me, a whole set of teeth. But that's all right, because they ain't going to pay for it. And I can't imagine why people want to say the things they say about me. I mean, what do y'all think? Why in the hell do people want to try to accuse me of being involved in that? Just, it, it, you've always been out front person. You've been a leader, well, I wasn't no not mean a phone. individual or... You know, cause well, no, but you could have been. I mean, you could be mean when it mean when mean gets mean. You can get mean. You've always been that way. People just don't know you is the only reason they're talking like they are about you. Because if they knew anything about you, they wouldn't be saying that. And I can't tell y'all how much I love you. You know, for being closer than a brother, but always being there for and me. I've been there, and I'm going to be there, and I'll be there till 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 hell freezes over. If, if you wouldn't worthy of it, it wouldn't be there. You, you ain't giving me nothing that. for nothing, are you? No, sir. Ain't nothing for free, is it? Uh-uh. But if I paid my dues? Yes, sir, you, you sure have. Right. You damn right. And they the world do. needs to know about it, don't they? They sure, sure do. do. They need to know the truth, and that's what we're sitting here talking about, is the truth. That's, that's right. right. And the devil-worshipping son of a bitches are the murderers out there, not the victims. There that's it right. is. And there's three and families that's victims. And I'd just like to catch those three. If you ever get within arm's reach of this arm right here, you a paid for son of a bitch. You got my word on it. Marion, 
how much hope do you have of a favorable ruling? Why is it so important for you to be here, for your son to see you in the courtroom? There's no reason for them to be here. They were falsely accused. The West Memphis Police Department did a botched job just to get these boys arrested. Somebody had to be arrested. It's ridiculous. Do you feel like the HBO film affected this case? I think it helped a lot. You think it helped? It yes, helped. I do. It helped, it helped your son? Yes, I think so. Why is that? that? Um, I just think that it shows enough on both sides to where um, you can kind of see a personal side of Damien. Do you feel like that his attorneys, that his uh, former attorney did not do an adequate job? Well, from what I'm saying, it looked like he didn't. What is the personal side of Damien? Um, you know him better than anyone. He's very much like myself. He usually keeps to himself and he doesn't really ever bother anyone. We're both very private. So what do you hope happens when this wraps up? I hope everyone can see this for the joke that it really is. Daniel Stidham. He defended one of the three individuals convicted in this case, Jesse Miss Kelly. Thank you for being with us. All right, Damian Eccles. Uh, he received money which was supposed to aid in his defense. How does this harm his trial, his right to a fair trial? In my opinion, Greg, it didn't. Hmm. I, I, I personally don't subscribe to that point of view. Interesting. Let me turn now to Ray Brown. He was a, a veteran criminal defense attorney and our colleague here at Core TV. Is there a conflict of interest here, Mr. Stidham, who was involved in it? He himself doesn't think so. Let's get to the real question, Greg, which is... That because this country is in many areas so strongly in favor of death penalty, that we underfund the defense. I think Mr. Stidham can tell you that he earned something like $19 an hour for his representation of his client. Uh, the lawyers for Eccles represent, uh, got a little bit more. But nowhere near the money needed and a $1,000 limit on money for experts in a case that is fairly saturated with scientific proof. So this is the kind of case in which we have to look at the question of whether the defendants were given a war chest because it's really the argument of the defense here that in fact the lawyers for Eccles were forced to make some kind of an agreement that involved invo letting their clients' conversations be overheard because they didn't have the resources to fight the case. Not something to be lightly tossed away or endangered. Daniel Stidham. If you had had a lot of money, what would you have done with it? Well, we would do some of the things that we're doing right now with regard to the forensic evidence. All right, Dan Stidham, anybody who defends somebody in a, in a capital death penalty case, I take my hat off to you. You're, you're deserving of many thanks for that, regardless of the circumstances, guilt or innocence. And thank you for being with us. We appreciate it. How, how can the medical examiner, when he conducts an autopsy, how can he miss uh, a bite mark on, on, on the victim's face. The reality is with any kind of physical evidence, with any kind of physical imprint of evidence like that or, compressors or pattern injuries like that, you have to really be trained to look for them. If you're not looking for it, you're not going to find it. And in this particular case, you have a preponderance of bite mark evidence that, uh, it, that seems very good and you're likely to get a very good result off of. Bite mark evidence is the kind of evidence that got Bundy, and that's the kind of evidence that's going to get the individual who's responsible for these crimes. We really have to be careful to protect the information that we have in that report and not disseminate it to individuals who are potentially going to release it. Because in my experience, uh, in cases that I've worked on, when there's an offender who finds out that there's bite mark evidence that's potentially going to be used against them, even in prison, uh, they're going to be making a visit to the uh, prison dentist and they're going to have those teeth removed because they do not want that evidence linked back to them. They know that bite mark evidence is just as good as a fingerprint in the court of law. Now, Mark, are you married? No, sir, I'm widowed. My wife passed away March 29th of 96. I'm sorry to hear that. March 29th of 96. Where yes. was this at? In Cherokee Village. Cherokee Village. Natural death? Uh, cause of death undeterminable. What do you... 
you have any feelings about it? I mean, uh, yes, sir. What what are that? If you want to reveal it to me. My wife had uh, given up her will to live after our baby was murdered, and she just didn't want to live anymore. And she got into an addiction, and I think the addiction helped Drugs. kill her. Yes, sir. What what type? Delilah. Have you had any any other problems with the police? Not major, no, sir. You've had problems? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. Oh, well, speeding tickets. I got a DWI one time after my wife was murdered. Uh, nothing really major. No, no robbery, no speeding. Oh, no, no felonies or anything like that. Okay. From what I see, what you're telling me is you are not a hateful, mean person. You're not the kind of person who goes around causing distress to people. You don't steal. You don't um, you don't go out of your way to harm people. No, sir. Or anything like this. I and you much. said there was maybe one time ever that you had uh, hurt someone in a fight or something? Oh, I'm sure. In football games, I hurt well, people, you know. Yeah, but you're... You know, football's one thing, but did you go out there meaning to hurt somebody? Oh, no, I went out there for the sport of the game, you know. And you know, if you do something, you, I think that kind of comes with the territory. If you get it? hurt, it comes with it. Now, if someone intentionally low blocks you or trips you to injure you, that's one thing. Did you ever do that? No, sir. I played tight end. I caught the ball and ran. Did you ever want to hurt somebody? Yes, sir. There's three people right now I'd like to hurt. With the exception of those three people? No, sir. There were a number of people that looked like good suspects initially, like a phone call would come in and, and you would start checking on it and, and it was like, hey, we may have something here. And then you'd find out, well, no, there's no way this person could have done it. So, I mean, it, you, it was like, an, uh, I, I think at the time I referred to it as an emotional roller coaster. You, you just had ups and downs, ups and downs, and, and that just wears you out. I know for a period of time, uh, a couple of weeks into the case, maybe two to three weeks into the case, uh, at that point, I was personally feeling like uh, Damien was responsible for this. And um, I got to the point where I could see him at the doorway of my bedroom. I'm sure a lot of that had to do with just being exhausted physically, mentally, and, and no sleep. But uh, just really, really even becoming a little paranoid and terrified myself. I think Gary Gitchell has an overactive imagination. Um, I believe deep in his heart that he knows that we did not commit those murders, but now it's too late for him to come forward and say that, to say he made a mistake And at this point in time. I mean, that would, it's just something he can't do now. So I think he, he's kind of been playing this part for so long that now he probably believes this part he's been playing himself. He's fooled himself into thinking it's true. Okay, here's the question. Bill says, what did you think of Paradise Lost? And your haircut then? <laughs> that haircut was actually given to me about five minutes before the hearing. Uh, by a woman in the back room with a pair of plastic scissors. I was not to blame for that haircut. Um, as for the movie itself, it was very emotional for me. Um, I think I went through the entire range of emotions while I was watching it. Uh, I, I think it made me a little homesick. Really? Yeah. Was it weird to see Jason again? Yeah, he didn't even look like I remembered. I guess because so many years have gone by that I had begun to forget what he looked like until I saw him on there. And I mean, when I was looking at that, we were both children. We were still kids. The entire way that I carried myself back then, my entire demeanor back then, as compared to now, I think I've changed a very great deal. Did you feel roped into doing Paradise Lost, forced into it, or did you no, pretty much no, trust I these guys? Was, I wanted to do it. You know, at the time we needed some kind of positive publicity, or at least some way, some kind of forum to um, express uh, what I wanted to say to kind of combat just what the prosecution was releasing to the media. 
some kind of objective thing where I could actually express something. But I also did it because I just thought it would be fun. So you trusted the filmmakers pretty much to to do a fair portrayal of what was going on. Yeah, I trusted them, but at the same time, even if I didn't, what did I have to lose? This is true. What did you think of Byers? I think Byers is probably the fakest creature to ever walk on two legs. I don't think there's a true thing about him. He puts on all these false faces. He, he'll act one way whenever they have cameras on him and another way when he's by himself. He has about 30 different faces. So seeing him in the movie didn't change how you know, any your opinions about him. Then. Well, I think it, it it reinforced the opinions that I have about him. I still believe with all my heart that he is the person who killed those three children. And Alone. I have no sympathy for Byers. I'm sitting here on death row for a crime that he committed. That in itself is enough to make me have no sympathy for him. But then also the fact that he killed three little kids. Do you think Melissa had anything to do with it? I don't think she actually participated in, in the act of killing them, but I think she participated in covering it up. I, I firmly believe that she knew, and I think that's why she's dead now. If you could say, if you could give Byers a message, what would it be? I wouldn't say anything to Mark Byers. Mark Byers is beneath me. He doesn't even deserve my contempt. You butchered my babies out here. I swore I'd stand at your grave and cuss it. Well, I'm doing it a little bit early. I'm gonna bury you three bastards right here and send you to hell. It's crime scene tape. I come off of what they stretched in front of me when they found my babies out here. Wouldn't let me by. I thought it was just fitting to bring it back to your memorial fund. Jesse, you got your flyers. That's your head marker, you animal. Damien. Jason, there's yours. You want to worship the devil? See him. I'm going to give you a farewell party. Now we're going to have some fun. I'm going to try to help send you on your way. You done got all my blessings, which aren't none. What do you think? You ready to die? Fire for fire. Death for death. Live through this fire, you animal. What well, ain't hot enough for you? This is the ditch. 
since you killed the man. Do you remember? You want to eat my baby's testicles? Burn, you son of a bitch. Burn. Burn. Go to hell. Burn. Can you remember screaming and hearing them holler? Stump on your grave. A stump on your grave. A stump on your grave. Burn and go to hell. Burn like you deserve to burn. Young people involved in the occult, do you see any particular type of dress? I have uh, personally observed people wearing uh, black fingernails, having their hair painted black, wearing black t-shirts. Sometimes they will tattoo themselves. Look at history. Look at hundreds of years of religious history. There have been hundreds of people killed in the name of religion. It is a motivating force. It gives people who want to do evil, want to commit murders, a reason to do what they're doing. West Memphis is pretty much like second Salem right now. Because everything that happens there, every crime, no matter what it is, it's blamed on Satanism. This case has attracted a lot of young people that relate to Damien. Yep. And it scared the hell out of them, so that's why they want to be there. And yet, you got to tell them, if they're dressed in black, man, that's, that's not going to help Damien at all, because it's just going to look like Damien has a cult following. We dressed in suits, and they still thought we were in a cult. Ooh, so, yeah. I mean, if we get people at the hearing that insist on dressing in all their goth glory, then it's just going to confirm everything that they think, that there's still a cult, that, you know, Damien's still controlling the cult from prison. I mean, people are telling me that stuff. I mean, reporters. Well, I was asked by a reporter if I was a member of Damien's cult. Me too. And, uh, and I'm, I'm standing there wearing a suit. I thought I was dressed like a guy, like a normal person, you know. But the, um, I think what, I, what we were trying to do is we don't want to give them any fuel for that. I think it's they're not. afraid if they dress conservative, they're going to be on the other side, the enemy side. <laughs> right. Like, they have to dress like Damien or something if they want to be on his side. Right. I don't know what that is. Well, look how he dresses now in court. You know, he wears all white in prison. Yeah. And, uh, and when he goes to court, he's wearing, you know, like, nice clothes. I mean, he's grown up a lot. Yeah, and a lot of people only know Damien from the movie, so they see these little bits of Damien in the movie, and that's what they think they're reacting to, but they don't realize that's, like, five years ago. I want to remind you this is a fundraiser, so I want you to give from your heart because these young men are kind of counting on us. <laughs> and just for the First record, paycheck. anyone, if you know someone that hasn't been able to make it here today or for whatever reason left early, if you'll remind them this cauldron's going to be available for the next couple weeks to continue to add to. So I, I'm putting money in here because I want Damien to be able to go to college outside of prison. Hey, I want him to go to a real school. Really soon. And remember, too, that he had the courage to say he was Wiccan in adversity when he knew that it would cost him a lot. All of us who are here are here because we enjoy knowing that there is religious freedom, hopefully somewhere, yeah. that we all respect each other for our beliefs, for our loves, for everything that we have. They wrote it off as something, well, we don't understand that. It's got to be the work of the devil. Well, you know, Wicca, Wiccans don't believe in the devil. Okay, the devil is a Christian deity. They use the devil, or they believe that the devil is something that causes them to do evil things. And in the Wiccan read, in the Wiccan tradition, those folks believe that you are 100% responsible for your actions. And they believe in the law of three. Whatever you do comes back on you threefold. If you put out good energy, that's coming back to you threefold. If you put out negative energy and dark energy, that's coming back on you threefold. That is what the Wiccan 
means. I know that as a Wiccan, that every religion is important to me. And if, if I felt like even Christians, that they weren't having their right to be, you know, they couldn't <laughs> practice in their way, I would defend that. It's not about just me being Wiccan. This is about how did this affect three little boys whose murderers I personally believe went un unfounded. And there's three young men who are in jail, and one of them's there, and he's on death row just because he said, I'm Wiccan. Could you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what some principles about the Wicca religion. Um, it acknowledges a goddess in a higher regard as a god because people have always said we are all God's children and men cannot have children. Um, it's basically like a close involvement with nature. Okay, here's the question. Well, I was wondering what made you go change your religion back to Catholic. Uh, I haven't changed my religion to anything. At this point in time, I don't really make any distinctions between religions anymore. And they say that a lot of people in prison find God. Well, I never knew God was lost. And um, I just, I don't like to put a label over myself anymore. Did you ever? Well, at one time I didn't really mind because I thought maybe there was some sort of distinction between religions, but then I realized that there's not. I think all religions basically teach... Our time limit is about to be exceeded. Your call will be terminated in 30 seconds. I think all religions basically teach the same message. And I think it's the people who... who create all these dogmas and strict rules and try to enforce this belief that if you don't believe the way they do, that you're going to suffer. Have you forgotten this face? I hope not, because it's going to come visit you when you die and look up from hell. It'll be just like Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, the rich man looks up from hell. What's he do? Beg for a drop of water none was given. You'll beg, because my baby shall put his foot across your neck. How do I know that? Well, it's an easy song. The Bible tells me so. And there's so much in here that's in store for you. If you don't have one, rush out to your nearest bookstore and get one, you lowlife. Have the Gideons mail you one. Read it. Live it. Believe it. It is your destiny. Hell awaits you. Okay. Burke's going to talk here. Hey, Burke, tell him what it is. We got everybody in here? Who am I telling? What are you saying? We have most of the people here. Well, this, should I just start talking? Go ahead. Okay, this is a, uh, this is a, a collection of postcards that we've received from people from all over the world uh, in support of this cause. They've, they've all written Free the West Memphis Three all over these postcards. The goal is actually to deliver this to the governor, show the governor the support that these three have. It's more like, it's like a, it's kind of working as a petition more than it is anything else. It's a way for people to express their concerns about this. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you You're watching KATV Channel 7, the spirit of Arkansas. This is Channel 7 News at 6. Did defense attorneys sabotage Damian Eccles' case by sitting on potentially explosive evidence? His new attorneys think so. Edward Millett says the men who represented Eccles in his first trial not only botched the case by selling the story to HBO, but they failed to investigate obvious leads. Millett also claims that he has new evidence of a human bite mark on one of the victims. Judge David Burnett granted his motion to get bite mark impressions from Damien's two co-defendants. Under cross-examination, Val Price, Eccles' previous attorney, testified that he did his best to represent Eccles. But Brent Turvey, a forensic scientist, disagrees. He says Price sat on critical evidence, namely bite marks he's found on the victim's bodies. That kind of stuff is like absolute proof of who did this. I mean, if they can get bite impressions, it's like, it's like a fingerprint. It's done. Yeah, they can we, identify who it is, period. Or we at least exclude these three boys. Yeah. yeah. That we have no question that they're innocent. 
So that's one way of trying to prove that. The three they've got are the three that did it. You are entitled to your opinion, but to spread your propaganda that you believe they are innocent, I think is crap. Bite marks aren't propaganda. That's solid 100% evidence. It hasn't been proven they're bite marks yet, though. It has been. And you're very convinced 100% they're guilty, right? And you're 100% you know, convinced of your own innocence. No so why don't, you, why don't you give your bite impressions to the defense? Do you think that I'm guilty that I had something to do with murdering my son? You're not saying anything about that. I don't know if you had anything to do with it. I want to know that you didn't, and that would be by okay. giving your Rule yourself bite out for it. I've already been exonerated. What else do I have to do? The public's been kind of suspicious of you. What happened to Melissa? I believe she died from a broken heart. But you were there, so you saw something, I was asleep right? beside her and woke up and found her passed away beside me. There were no bruises, abrasions, anything like that of any foul play whatsoever. I've been totally exonerated. All charges or suspicion of anything dropped. Well, I do know there was a toxicology report, and they talked about actually quite a lot of drugs that were in her yes, system. Yes, a lot of prescription drugs that she was taking. Sure did. Well, also some prescription drugs she wasn't taking. She took like seven or eight different types of medication for being bipolar, manic, depressive, post-traumatic syndrome. And as far as the other medication, I'm as puzzled about it as anyone. I read in the newspaper, it was actually Arkansas Times. Yes. Mara Levert said that there were signs she was suffocated. There were no signs of suffocation or struggle. She was laying right there on the bed when the paramedics and all came in. Someone published something in the newspaper about me that was suspicious like that, that pointed the finger at me and said I was this and said I was that. I'd want to prove okay. to somebody that I hadn't, that I had then nothing to do tell me with. what I have not done to prove that I have not been involved in any of it. I have no problem with a polygraph, sodium pentothal, being hypnotized, bite marks or anything else, which I've submitted to every test they have asked every question they have asked because I know my innocence. Do they take bite your impressions? bite mark impressions? I mean, if you're that convinced. Okay. Dental records. You know, how could you give your bite impressions if you don't have your teeth? Maybe that's why you're not so reluctant to do it. Uh, what if I told you that the teeth that I had before they were pulled, that the teeth that I had during it I know the oral surgeons and all that did the work, and I would be glad to sign a release for them to send my x-rays. Will you do that? If need be. Like I said, I've cooperated with that? the police. Instance, send it to Dan I won't do a damn thing for you. Do it for Dan Stiddle. Do it for your kid. Do it for the, do it, just do it to prove us wrong. Yeah. I don't have to prove one damn thing to you. If it turns out that we're wrong, we'll, we'll admit it, I promise you. Bend over and put your head between your legs and kiss your ass goodbye because you're going to be wrong. I think y'all are fighting a lost cause. I'm just trying to get to the truth. As a young boy at the age of 13, I started down many of the wrong roads that a lot of teenagers will go down. I remember the first dollar I stole was out of my mama's purse. First people I stole from my parents. Boy, it just went down a rough and rugged road from there. I can remember quite vividly the day that I came to from a comatose state. I had overdosed to my parents' home. <coughs> Next day, they were on the phone with my brother-in-law and sister down in Jackson, Mississippi. Said, will y'all take him? He's out of control. We can't do anything with him. I saw my brother-in-law, big, tall, red-headed fella. And I said, you don't know all the wrongs I've done. He said, well, let me show you over here. He explained to me about the Apostle Paul. He said, don't get up there and think that you're the worst that's been. He said, the Apostle Paul's already took that privilege. And he says, I am the chief sinner. So I thought, well, if the Lord could save the Apostle Paul and look beyond his sin, he could save me too. When this last tragedy came into our life, I stood by my son's casket. And I said, oh God, help me. Lord, I'm looking to you. I want to be the dad that stands in the gap, that'll stand for you regardless to what the world says. I don't care. Lord, I can't do this on my own. I need you. And you know, there was a peace that surpassed all understanding.
that came upon me in that funeral home. And I thought, thank God for that. Thank the Lord for after 20-something years of living like a savage on this earth that he knocked at my heart's door and spoke to me. And I'm so glad I invited him in. I want to know who in the community had access to those victims, who would be trusted with those kids. I want to know what the relationships were in that community because who was killed tells you why they were killed. Look at how clear of a line we're drawing between the homicide and the behavior of Chris, of Chris Byers. Uh, my feeling is that this kid was being abused. Chris Byers was setting fires. He was uh, playing with his own excrement. He was beating up other kids, picking fights. He was, uh, he was on Ritalin. His, the doctor was saying he was going to hospitalize him. He was a kid who had behavioral problems and problems of being defiant and violent and aggressive and impulsive for at least three years that this neurologist had been seeing him. And this doctor in his uh, report states, I'm giving this kid, I've been prescribing him Ritalin for the past three years. Nothing's come of it. Nothing, he, I can't, under, he even says, it, it, does not, it does not make sense to me. I, I'm, I'm at a loss to explain why his behavior has not abated. Because what Ritalin is, is it's a, it's a kiddie depressant, is what it does, is it takes kids and makes them, uh, it makes them uh, more docile. But Ritalin is a funny drug, and it's my understanding and, I, and you have to talk to somebody who really knows what's talking about this, but it's my understanding that in adults, Ritalin is, an, is, a, is, a, is, a, is like speed. It's the exact opposite effect. So you think that maybe the kid wasn't getting the prescription? Well, if he was else. getting the prescription, he wouldn't have been exhibiting those behaviors. And he was exhibiting those behaviors. So my only thought would be that he was not getting his prescription. They had a little book they wrote in at school. I still can't go through a lot of his things. It's still too painful. It's his journal. It's his journal. And uh, it was on a Wednesday. And he had written nothing on the page except just, I love my mommy. And that's all he'd written on the page. And I know that if he could come to me, he would say, Mommy, it's okay. And I'm all right. And you need to be all right, too. And I still love you. And I love Daddy, and I love Ryan. Now, I want you to pull yourself together, Mommy, and I want you to go ahead and live. Because I'm okay now. I'm okay. I'm all right. You don't have to worry about me. What was your relationship with your wife? Did you all get along? Pretty good? As long as I could keep her from using, we did. I could keep her off of it a couple months, and she'd go back to it. I, the first rehab I put her in was nine months after we were married, and I had a doctor tell me then that you all just go ahead and divorce her. He said, you know, heroin junkies, one out of, I don't know what the statistic exactly he gave me, he said, ever stay clean. He said, this is going to cause you a lot of pain and misery. Do you use drugs? No, sir. Have you ever used drugs? Yes, sir. What? What did? What? Marijuana. I've tried coke, some pills. Do you ever have a habit? No, sir. Never you, been you just casual yet. experimenting or casual Just experimenting as a teenager and going to college. That's it. Oh, you have a brain tumor? Yes, sir. Is it troubling you? Now, have you got it under control? Or? Well, I'm I'm under doctor's care. Are you taking medication? Yes, sir. What? What? Is it, uh, well, just tell me what it is. Now, tell me what it is. Tell me what it does. Uh, is, it, is it for a nervous condition? Yes, or, sir. Okay. It helps. It helps me from my anxiety and panic attacks and the terrible nightmares that I have when I go to sleep okay. a lot of times. Have you I, taken your dosage today? This one is in the morning. This one's in the evening. This one's in the evening. This one's three times a day, and this one's three times a day. The Xanax on me works like Ritalin does on children. What happens when you don't take this? I'll get real nervous and just like my uh, kind of paranoid feeling, I'll just have panic attacks. Your doctor said that you had a multitude of psychiatric problems. What does he mean by that? 
Have you been diagnosed as having a particular, some sort of a psychiatric condition that has a name to it that they've told you about or anything? Just from what she said, manic depressive post-traumatic stress syndrome. You ever hallucinate? Yes, sir, I have. I've seen a bug on the floor or something, and that's generally when I'm in a manic or a panic attack, you know, it'll seem like I'll see things out of the corner of my eye, and it's really not there. Have you ever, have you ever believed that you might have been involved somehow? No, this, sir. Where the boys down there? No, You've never sir. had any hallucinations or anything dealing with that? Only nightmares of hearing my son crying for help, and I couldn't help him because I didn't know where he was. Michael Moore was found in this area right here at the bottom of the screen. Steve Branch was found just just behind where these trees are in the stream. And Christopher Byers was found just below that body right here. This is Exhibit 22, which is the body of Michael Moore after removing him from the water. The way he was found. This is the body of Steve Branch. He branches the young man that had the injuries to his face. Was it a particular part of his face? On the left side of the chin area. <clears throat> State Exhibit 24, the body of Christopher Byers. And what kind of injuries did uh, Chris Byers have that you observed? It looked as though his penis had been removed. When they were describing the injuries to my son, of course, I didn't see many of the photos, but just hearing the description, uh, it brought back things that had happened to me in my past when <clears throat> I was tortured and when I was attacked and when I had, uh, had five people beat me up and torture me, but I lived through it. And it brought back all those feelings and all those emotions of it happening to me. And it was like they were reading off what happened to me and I lived through it instead of what happened to Christopher. And it was just almost like a, a mental thing. It just, uh, I basically just had a mental breakdown from just, you know, from hearing it. It was like a living nightmare reliving it all over again. Except it wasn't me that they were reading it about, it was my son. Well, uh, from my brain tumor. It's been acting up, giving me a lot of problems. I just passed out the other day and busted my head open in the house, blacked out, hit the door facing. Yeah, it's gonna have to be operated on soon. When are you gonna do that? Uh, probably after Christmas. Yeah. Somebody's Jones Pro folks? Hmm? Is this somebody's Jones Pro folks? Oh, I don't know. Are they all out from west? All over the place. We got There's uh, about six or eight from Arkansas. I think. We got Ohio, we got New Jersey, New Jersey, Illinois, California, Tennessee. Well, ignorant spreads real fast. Hey, why are you being so mean to us now all of a sudden when the cameras are rolling? You're so nice mean. to us when the cameras are I'm off. I'm not being mean to you. I'm <laughs> just speaking my mind. You are two people. No. <laughs> you are. If you, can't you were my stand buddy last time. I'm what happened? I never <laughs> said you was my best friend. You know. <laughs> well, you were nice to me at least. Now you're telling me I'm ignorant, ignorant, idiot, and all that. It's like when the cameras roll, I'm an idiot. When they're not, we're buddies. What's up with that? The truth <laughs> hurts. Might as well be on film. Okay, so this is the truth. This is so the when the cameras part. stop, that's not the truth. No. That's the untrue part. No. Which one's true? The way I act around you is one thing. Two things. Which one's real, though? Uh, which one you think's real? I don't know. Well, I guess it'll stay a mystery then. Okay. Mark, do you have any mind impressions to the defense? There's not going to be any need to that. I'll be taking a polygraph very soon. And when that's all that's cleared, why should I give uh, bite marks? Well, just because the bite marks would exclude you, absolutely. And I think that would be would good. Bite marks would exclude me anyway. I don't have any teeth. These are dentures. Yeah. These are... The bottom ones are too? Yeah. So you're going to take bite marks to two gum prints? Yeah. Give me a break. Of course, a little That will fade in a while. They were done before the kids were murdered. Strikes all that theory out. When did you get your dentures? Because I think I remember on the steps you said that that was a little, you said it was after the kids died. It was right then. You had your 
dentures right when they died? No, I found them since 93 at the start. The last time you said it was after. My mistake. How did you lose your teeth? Because I've heard you lost them, but not how. Uh, because I was taking Tegretol for my epileptic seizures, and Tegretol causes periodontal disease, and they all started rotting and falling, coming out. It just fall out, you didn't have to pull Yeah, them. you have a periodontal disease. That's when the gums literally move away from your teeth. It's my understanding that the odontologist has now reviewed bite mark impressions from all three defendants, compared them with the bite mark, which uh, the odontologist has identified, and uh, we can exclude the three defendants who've been convicted as the person who made that bite mark. What's exciting about this is, is we now know that this kid was bitten by someone, and this someone was not any of the three defendants. And it's, it's just, uh, you know, I wish and pray that this information would have been available to us back at trial. I think the result would have been dramatically different. This is the interesting thing. Brent Davis, the prosecutor, claims that this is not a bite mark, but as Frank Peretti, who performed the original autopsy, says that this is a bell-shaped uh, pattern abrasion that is consistent with a, a belt buckle. They're interpreting having looking looking back at this injury they're interpreting it and it's only a two this is a two dimensional surface if we were looking at a three dimensional surface we would see that this actually creates a circle because the eye socket curves in and curves under the two dimensional photograph makes it look like a bell shape basically they're going to uh, put on two guys one of which did the original autopsy and missed this bite mark and basically state that this isn't a bite mark the bottom line here is that this is not legal trickery this is hard physical evidence of somebody else committing this crime. I know you've been here probably for just about every hearing. Can you tell me what your opinion on this? Well, I think the fact that there's bite marks and they don't match the three is pretty much proof that they didn't do this. And the big thing now is for the first time in the history of this case, we've got qualified experts involved. It's as simple as that. And what does he think it will do to his case? Well, he knows he's going to be out of prison before long. Eventually, the truth is going to come out. And... Are you going to be here till the end? Yes. We're going to be here however many times it takes. Have you been following the case? No. You know, but I've seen what happened. You saw what happened? Mm -hmm. What happened? Hey, hey, I'm not sure if the three boys done it or not, but the three boys were there. Excuse me. The three, the three boys were there. But, it, but there's one more that's running on loose right now, and he, and he lives here in Jumbo right now. Who is he? Mark Byers. You believe Mark Byers had something to do he, with this? He was holding a knife. Well, what more proof do you need? He was holding a knife. The three boys were not holding a knife. Mark Byers was. And how did you witness this? I seen it. Have you told the police what you uh, saw? Yeah, well, well, I've tried to tell police, but nobody wants to listen to me. I've tried to tell prosecutors, they don't want to listen to me. Why don't they want to listen? I don't know. I've been in an accident before, you know, and they think I'm all scrambled up. I'm probably signing my death warrant right now. I'm probably doing that right now. But so I don't care. Name, but I don't care. That this didn't really mean. You can get it somewhere else. I have no more comments. <laughs> the guy that you just interviewed over yeah. there, that's sensational. He's like the, he's just like Jesse Miss Kelly. He's a he's a guy who's got a story. And you're gonna I bet here's my bet. I'm gonna I don't know we're gonna, gonna see do. that on the news tonight. <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna And it's gonna do. be big you know, groundbreaking revelation confession and and you guys just are gonna as long as that's just, not the only thing, you know. <laughs> 
Don't preempt everything else to show that. But I wonder if you're going to use any footage that you got of Steve Baker, anything that talks about facts or anything that was uh, brought up in court today, any of the any of the news, oh, yes, as, opposed the the news. The, as opposed to the as opposed to the the uh, fiction. Only one news story that I saw mentioned that the bite mark impressions did not match any of the three boys in jail. That was the big news and yesterday. And that was no, the important the thing that happened yesterday. And nobody mentioned except for one news report that I saw this morning. Added as an afterthought. Oh, and by the way. None of the bite impressions well, taken see, matched. I got that afterwards because I couldn't stay here, so I had to call but someone. And so ask. I added it. Everybody you could find I added. You well, we did. We out. came here. Well, I did, and I put that into my story. I, I have it in my story. Okay. But um, in the first um, case, did they have? Did the state bring their own odontologist? No, there was never mention of bite marks. They wouldn't have brought an odontologist. If they had brought an odontologist, that would have suggested that they knew there were bite marks, or some reason to bring one. But there was no, originally, it was either overlooked or ignored, so they had no reason to bring in an odontologist because it wasn't mentioned in the first trial. When was that? I, someone told me that. Um, someone lied to you. It someone, it was yeah. probably, you probably saw it on the news. I don't <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Now, live from the Good Station, this is K-8 News at 6. It was a packed courtroom again as supporters and families of both victims and convicted listened to the last day of testimony. The state called two state medical examiners who testified they did not find any bite marks. However, odontologist Dr. Thomas David testified for the defense that in his opinion it was a bite mark. The state called Dr. Harry Mincer, also a forensic odontologist, said that it was not a human bite mark. While the state and defense seesaw back and forth, Damien's supporters remain optimistic. How you doing? Fine. Good. Okay, here's the deal. I'm, they're going to talk to me from New York. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be talking to me. You're going to, we're going to put an earpiece in. You're going to hear Greg Jarrett, who's the host in him. New York. Yeah, his name is Greg. You can just call him Greg if you want to. Gotcha. And when you answer his questions, just look at the camera instead of me. No problem. Okay? Need to dress this. Act like I've done it a hundred times. Right? You have done it a hundred times. <laughs> Is he all right? No, he's fine. He's okay. fine where he is. Yeah. All right. Is my son's picture good? We're joined now by John Mark Byers, adoptive father of the victim Christopher Byers. Thank you for taking the time with us. Mr. Byers? That man? Yeah. That Mr. Byers, do you hear me? He hadn't said a word to me. Uh, uh, obviously, we're having no, some nothing coming to you here. technical difficulties. Mr. Byers, can you hear me? This is New York. Mr. Byers? I'm not speaking to you. Can you, Tim, can you? Yeah, I can hear you great. Can Go you ahead. hear him now, Mr. Byers? No, I cannot. You're OK, Timmy. Don't worry about your mic. I got you dead. Can you hear him now? And let's get it checked in, and then we'll go for the third block. Does that make sense, Tim? Yeah, that's fine. Tim, see, okay. this thing is okay. 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 Mr. Schultz is going to join us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Timmy, you still got me, right? Yeah, I got you, Dom. I got All right, you. Mr. Saltz, can you hear me, sir? Yes. You can? Yes. And uh, Mr. Byers, can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Myers uh, joins us again. Hopefully we've solved the technical problem. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. What do you think of Eccles and the defense team saying you're the killer? I have a very good answer for that. I'm 6'8 and weigh 252 pounds. I'm the largest red herring they've ever thrown in a jewelry box. Someone else to take the jewelry's mind off the three real murders. All right, joining us now also is in Jonesboro, Burke Sauls. He helps run the Free the West Memphis Three Support Fund. Um, do you believe that Mr. Byers is the real killer? I, I don't really, yeah, that's not the point of what we're doing here. I'm, I'm not here to accuse anyone. That's, that's actually what happened to these three guys. One of the things that I guess a lot of people can't get over is one of the three defendants, all three were convicted, Jesse, Miss Kelly, confessed. Uh, how do you account for that? Well, to, to the experts that testified in the trial, it was a, it, it was a, to them, it was a, a, a forced confession. It was coerced. What was coercive about it? For one thing, there was a timeline problem where he stated it happened in, 
early in the day and, and they, they led him down to the time that they wanted him to say that it had happened. And uh, he eventually gave them what they wanted. I want to thank all of you for being with us. We appreciate it. Coming up next on Primetime Justice, President Clinton's war with independent counsel King really? Starr isn't over yet. I really appreciate what y'all have done for them. <laughs> I think just the fact that we live in Los Angeles and we have maybe some talents that we could probably help this case out somewhat. I know at the airport yesterday, there was a young guy that walked past us and he had a black shirt, black pants, black trench coat, and black boots. And I thought, <laughs> you get in trouble at that for some, pla at some places. Yeah, welcome to LA. Like 50% of people live here dressed like that. They were like, well, there's, there's a guy wearing all black. There's a woman wearing all black. There's another guy wearing all black. <laughs> It's a flattering color. <laughs> a lot of the reason that Damien wore the black was because someone told him that he was sexy in the black, and then he wore it most of the time. <laughs> That's your argument. Yes. That's your argument. argument that these guys are guilty. It's like, come on, how silly is this? So, and of course, you know, there was the media that portrayed these guys to start. Yeah, and he, That's what it, did it. Yeah. They, and yeah. they, they, I couldn't believe all the, they overwhelmed us from the very beginning when they arrested him and the media attacked yeah. him. See, now it's our turn yeah. to use the media to our advantage. Because the first time around, there was no critical thinking. They just reported whatever they might have heard or a rumor. And they report it, and you hear it on the news, you think it's true. Well, now we have the Lisa show to show fact. For once, you know, there's, it's not emotional. It's not about how people feel. It's about facts. And we're glad to have you guys here, too. Yeah, guys I mean, it's really them. important to have your guys' voices be heard. I Are you guys so. nervous about the show? Very. <laughs> <laughs> Just be yourselves. You'll do good. Oh, you'll be fine. You're still all nervous? Very. Very okay. nervous. Joining us once again. How do you feel like the, the Lisa show went? Do you think it went well? or? Oh, I thought it went really well. You could hear people in the background that didn't know anything about the case. You could hear them coming along as they presented stuff. Like the first, when the mothers were out there, there was sort of some skepticism. You could kind of hear them talking. Like no one was sure whether to believe it or not. And then as more and more came out and you guys were talking more, you could hear people starting to get angry. What was the audience reaction about the when? They learned that all three defendants had been excluded from making the bite mark. It's like, match the bite mark, find the killer. I mean, I think everybody got that. It was like, OK, so the kids don't match the bite mark. And I think it sort of sunk in that that means that the, the kids shouldn't have a bite mark there. on his face. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't leave home oh, with a big, yeah. fat bite and mark on his face. If they missed that, what else did they miss? So did you guys see anything in Fire's interview? Like, did you guys notice, like, the, the conflicting stories? Like, what did you read from that? Did you get anything from that? Well, obviously, he's. I think he's a little mixed up about his felony uh, <laughs> history. <laughs> I noticed yeah, Byers wasn't true. wearing his teeth in the interview. That's true. Now, what happened with his teeth, do you know? Well, there's several different versions <laughs> of what happened. The first version that I heard is he got him knocked out in a fight. He changed his story. For, first, he a long time ago, he said he got knocked out in a fight, and he told Lisa that he had him surgically removed. And they told me that he'd taken Tegretol and that they had just kind of rotted oh, out. Burke and Grove told me last night that something about Byers had left his teeth somewhere, and that's why I didn't have him on during the taping. What, what was the story on that? I think the the producers of the show said that um, Byers had told them that he left them in a restaurant somewhere, 
And so his last parting words to the producers when he was leaving the show, which he had done without his teeth, is, I'm not leaving L.A. without my teeth. Test is about to begin. Is this the month of October? Yes. Regarding those deaths, do you intend to answer truthfully each question about that? Yes. Other than what we've talked about, did you ever wish any person would die? No. Did you harm any of those boys? No. Other than what we've talked about, did you ever think about hurting anyone? No. Did you harm any of those boys found at Robin Hood Hills? No. Test is over, remain seated, looking straight ahead. Here's the website. This is how all the people find us. Like they can come on here and they can read about everything that's been going on. It's a pretty good synopsis of mm -hmm. our involvement and what happened. We have an individual page for each Damien, Jason, and Jesse. They each have their own page. And then there's different links like the college fund for Damien. You know, his where it stands right now with him. Oh, this is a really good picture that's of Damien. He's looking yeah. kind of, oh, yeah, kind of dapper. <laughs> Here's Jason's page. He has some poems that we got. So we have an extra page just for his poetry. I never dreamed he could write poetry the way he does. Read his poem. An electric charge is in the air, the scent of burning ozone. The deep bass of thunder rumbles. You feel it in your stomach. The wind picks up. The clouds choke out the, bl out the blue skies. The rain pours down, drenching my soul. You are there, and I know I no longer face the storm alone. Mark, you feeling better? Yeah. You got that arm straightened out and had that smoke. Well, congratulations. Well, thank you, sir. I don't, uh, according to what we have here, the response is on the chart. I feel you're telling the truth about the issues we worked with as far as you see them. As you see. Give me a high five. Thank you. I knew it was right. I knew I was innocent. And to all of you morons, fools, and idiots that thought I had anything to do with it, I am now vindicated. Maybe this will serve a point to some of y'all. And I feel sorry my heart goes out to the victims who have to be put through things such as this. To just already try to clear my name when it's already been vindicated once. Now it's been vindicated twice by a professional who I have the utmost respect for. And I want each and every one of you devil worshipers to know that you are wrong and you need to go on another ghost hunt and leave me alone. Your call is being connected. Thank you for using MCI. Hello. How you doing? I'm on speakerphone. Yes. Hey, Damien. Your mom's yes. here. Yes. Say hi. Hi, son. Hello. How you doing? It's okay, I suppose. You I okay? You. Yeah, I'm okay. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I miss you. Miss you too. I don't want to hear any of that either. You know, I know you lie every time you come here, too, whenever you say you're not going to cry on the way home. But then you get out in the parking lot and just cry. Not every time. Why are you crying? I just miss you. Well, I miss you, too, but I'm not doing all that. Calm down. How about you? I love you, baby. Calm down. I'm okay. Stop crying. You have exceeded I'm not crying. Your minute. This call is being Your call is terminated. Now that I live alone, I have a lot of time on my hands. 
for my own demise or for my own well-being, whichever I so choose. I so choose for my welfare and my well-being rather than my demise. And you might wonder, what do I do with all my spare time? Well, I still enjoy singing, and I took several songs and put them together, went to a studio here in the town I live in, and I recorded a song that meant a lot to me, and it has been a great blessing of faith and hope that has helped me through every day, and there's not a day go by that I don't listen to it or sing it, or at least try to remember part of it. And if you'd like, I'll sing a little of this song for you today. This came after hours of work and $45. You can have anything made. Every new little piece of information that surfaces with this case points away from the three guys who are currently serving prison sentences, and one of them's on death row. If the three defendants ever got out uh, and, and were released, I would be sick. I wasn't convinced uh, from the evidence that it was a bite mark and so ruled. The West Memphis police are never going to admit they, they botched this up. They're not ever going to admit that they got the wrong people. I'll watch you, you bastard Damien Eccles, take your last breath, you low life son of a bitch. If I were released today, 
I would kind of want to just blend into obscurity. I wouldn't want to be remembered. You know, I wouldn't want to walk down the street and, and have someone say, hey, you're that kid that was on death row that they made that documentary about.